Even Magic Johnson was considered the greatest winner of his time. There it is, it's over, and the most valuable player is Magic Johnson. Michael Jordan was considered the greatest winner of his time. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship in the last eight years. Together, they made 15 NBA Finals appearances, but they only met for the title once in June of 1991 in a battle that basketball fans will always remember. From the moment he entered the NBA in 1979, Magic Johnson made his Los Angeles Lakers a special team. They were graceful, they were stylish, and they always put on a great show. Still going, still going. Oh! Watching this club go up and down the court and the crowds at the uh, Los Angeles Forum reacting to them. And, and just just the nickname, Showtime. I think they set the table for people being flamboyant, the no-look passes, the, the sky hooks, the, the fast breaks. It was just fun, fun basketball. But they also played winning basketball. And their eight finals appearances and five titles in the 80s were a testament to their greatness. They were what everybody else wanted to be. Getting through the 80s, beating Boston twice, winning five championships, I think that made the Lakers into a team of historical substance. Magic was the smiling face of the NBA's newest dynasty. But he was so much more than that. He was the ultimate floor general. Magic could control a game maybe better than anybody else because he always had the basketball and he determined who was going to get the ball. He made sure you were in the right spot or you wouldn't get it. He was the law. Uh, he was the man. You know, as we say, you know, you're the man. So it was phenomenal because he always seemed to call the right play at the right time. And he wasn't afraid to call his own number. Three seconds, two seconds. Magic's 18-footer wins it. Has he ever done it before? You bet he has. Will he ever do it again? Time and time again. He was basketball's new ideal. It's perfect player. One time I asked Johnny Wooden, and I said, who is the best? And he said, I would select Magic. They're all great. But he said, I'd select Magic because he makes everybody around him so much better. Irvin had a, a very unique ability to, to understand what was going on with the team and, and what was needed and who needed to be included and who needed to get shots. And um, that, that, that is the role of a point guard, but, but he had it down to a science. But by 1991, Magic's role would have to change. Laker mainstay Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had retired. And as Johnson entered his 12th year in the league, he became the elder statesman for a new type of team. Well, I think a lot of people probably thought the Lakers were done. Magic was certainly closer to the end of his career than the beginning. He was still a very, very good player. Not saying he wasn't, but, uh, you know, Worthy was toward the end of his career. They were using Sam Perkins at center. Uh, it was a different Laker team than the one that had gotten to the finals all those years during the 80s. Showtime had closed. And even stylish Laker head coach Pat Riley was replaced by Mike Dunleavy. Our, our style of play even changed a little bit more. Our running game wasn't what it used to be. We didn't run as much. Uh, Mike was more if he wanted to really kind of slow it down and go to a power game. You know, he wanted to post up Magic and post up James and post up Sam and Blotty. Let's slow it down and let's pound it inside. The Lakers had changed. But Magic was still the focal point. There's no surprise to Irvin and how, how he improved as a player. He spent time. He came early. He stayed late, you know, shooting free throws. He used to play three-point games with, with Byron and James Worthy. Then he eventually started working on the, on the hook shot, and that became a, a huge weapon for him. 
Magic had altered his game to adapt to his team. But the question a half a continent away in Chicago was whether Michael Jordan would ever be able to do the same and adapt to his. When Michael Jordan began his career with the Chicago Bulls in 1984, he brought an unmatched feeling of joy and wonder into the NBA. Jordan attacked the basket with ferocity that no one had ever seen before. And he split the double team and then dunk on a seven-footer at the basket. Attack and with a vicious uh, kind of a tomahawk attack that, that just I've never seen before or since. With a basketball in Michael's hands, it seemed that everything and anything was possible. The inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Good! The Bulls win! As popular as he was talented, Michael became an instant pop culture icon. Michael was it. Michael Jordan was the kind of player who you could give the ball to and he could win the ball game. You put a Nike shoe in his hand and you could sell 8 million Nikes. He came along at a time when society wanted someone who they could really identify with in every single aspect. But as Michael's star continued to rise, his magnificent solo performances began to draw criticism. As great as a virtuoso uh, as anyone can be, you have to find, figure out a way to mesh your great virtuoso skills with that of the other four guys to produce the maximum result. It was not easy for uh, Michael to do this. I mean, because when you have that kind of skill, you always assume that at this given moment, right here, right now, the best way for us to score is for me to take the ball and get a shot. There's no false modesty with Michael. He wasn't a braggart in any way, but it wasn't like, gee whiz, you know, I, I guess I could shoot pretty good. It was, I can do this. The Bulls have it. Here comes Michael Jordan on the drive, five seconds. Jordan on the drive, right of the lane, 18 footer. Yeah! 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 But despite a slew of high-scoring games, Michael couldn't prevent Chicago's playoff failures. And the Bulls fired three coaches in his first five years as they searched in vain for a way to turn Michael's team into champions. He was obviously driven from the, the belief in his own abilities. And, you know, from that standpoint, Michael made players feel like they weren't participating in the game. For all those years, we all know the criticism. He doesn't make his teammates better. One man, a guard can't win a championship. He's not a, a team leader. He's in it for himself. I mean, all those things were still very, very uh, loudly heard in a lot of circles around the NBA. There were some that said, hey, really what he is is George Gervin with a nice smile. Because he scored a lot of points, but his teams never won the ultimate games. And he was furious about that. It was such a frustrating thing for me, and I was very disturbed by it. And I think that was a part of the challenge. No one really, really felt that a scoring leader could lead their team to a championship. Michael was unfavorably compared to the unselfish Magic. And his leadership skills were called into question. He hadn't had made his players better. He, he, didn't, he didn't make them come up to the same level he was playing at. To Michael, the criticism seemed unjustified. Well, Michael's joke was always, well, Magic made players better. He says, well, I'd like to take a shot at making Kareem and James Worthy better. I'm trying to make Brad Sellers and Dennis Hobson better. Michael's frustration was evident as his teammates failed to play up to his lofty standards. I don't think that Michael really believed in his teammates. In 1989, Phil Jackson became Michael's fourth head coach, and from the outset, his goal was to make Jordan's Bulls more cohesive. I knew that I needed a system where he could play out of that would employ all the players, and if everybody participated in then that would empower them. 
Jackson unveiled the triangle offense. It was based on sharing the ball and the spotlight. Many wondered how long Michael Jordan would tolerate. This was the, the biggest test of the dynamics of the game, it was Michael Jordan's phenomenal physical, personal skill to see how he was going to be able to blend this in to bring everyone else along with him to achieve the goal. Okay, Jay, clear. Oh, Jay, Jay, turn around, Jay. Magic does his magic. I'll do it again, man. Jay, 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 Jay. Come on, Jay, we're back in five seconds. Come on, Jay, we're back in five seconds. Just a little bit of a look away. Just broke the defense. Silent, right? I love this game. Despite their new look, the 1991 Los Angeles Lakers still had their championship pedigree. Magic was still running the point, and James Worthy was still filling the lane and leading the team in scoring on their way to a 58-win season. There were great moments along the way as Magic became the NBA's all-time assist leader. Thank you, fans, for coming out every night and supporting me. The Lakers cruise past their first two playoff opponents, but in the Western Conference Finals, they would run into Clyde Drexler's Portland Trail Blazers. The Blazers had the league's best record and were the defending conference champions. Nobody's going to beat the Blazers. They were really the invincible team coming out of the box, and it was like sort of a wire-to-wire -wire kind of thing. Sort of like everybody was fighting for second. Portland was so good, and they had so much talent that they thought this was it, that there was no way the Lakers could beat them. But as veterans of many a playoff war, the Lakers didn't share that opinion. Even though the Portland had a better team on paper and in the standings, I think whenever the Lakers got into the Western playoffs, they felt they had a psychological edge. The series would pit the West's most confident team against its most talented. Three out of two. Drexler to And that is Portland's biggest lead. We always felt we were in the game. Even if they were up 20 in the first half, we always felt that we could come back and beat them. Johnson, baseball pass. Devons with a jam. With Magic controlling the action, the Lakers frustrated Portland and took a three games to two lead. And in the final moment of the sixth game, Magic would put his indelible stamp on the series. The opponents never really knew what he had left in his tank because he had all these tricks and he had a, a flair for doing things at the end of games. Trailing by one with seconds remaining, the Blazers were one basket away from sending the series back to Portland for game seven. Drexler brings it to Porter. He shoots and run it. It's straight. It's no good. Magic's got it. Throws it down the floor. One second, and it goes out of bounds. That's part of magic. I mean, how many guys can you think of in a basketball game who know exactly how much time is left in the game and will throw the ball up and know that it's going to expire when it comes down? He was always in control of every aspect of the game. Game's over. Listen to the Laker fans. The Lakers win it, ladies and gentlemen. And the Los Angeles Lakers are the Western Conference champions again. I like to be in a tough situation because it makes you have to think. And uh, only, only the men survive. And uh, here we are again. It's fun. We didn't go in and we didn't open up bottles of champagne and, and pour it all over each other. And uh, we had Sam Perkins with us that year. And Sam came in hopping up and down, jumping around. And we all sit down. <clears throat> and Irvin the next day had to apologize to him. He said, Sam, we don't celebrate Western Conference championships here. You know, our goals are much bigger. Meanwhile, back east, the Bulls were finally playing like a team as Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant were coming of age. Grant was there. 
and Michael was sharing the ball the way Jackson had always envisioned. While still continuing to provide material for the nightly highlight show. Oh, please, let's see that again. A hundred times. <laughs> Now Michael had only one last hurdle to clear before he could take on Magic. And the Bulls go back to the Eastern Conference Finals for the third year in a row. For three consecutive years, the Detroit Pistons had ended Chicago's season by humbling the Bulls and punishing Jordan in the playoffs. They even created a defense called the Jordan Rules, set up to frustrate Michael. 95% of the plays are for Michael Jordan, and the other 5% end up in his hand anyway. The harder Jordan played, the more he played into the Pistons' wily trap. This team that just roadblocked Michael, knocked the dog out of Pippen, uh, humbled Horace Grant, Isaiah virtually owned our guards. He was in their face, you know, out playing them and out talking them and out shooting them. 1990 was the hardest of them all for Jordan to bear as his bulls fell apart in the seventh game. lost that game I was very hurt so I went on the back of the bus I, I remember my father coming on the bus and you know I'm back ye yelling and screaming he's doing all his best to try to calm me down and say it's only a game you would get be given another opportunity and I'm saying well we've been given so many opportunities we're not going to get as many as you may think and I vowed from that point forward that you know we get put in this position again we want to get past Detroit and go into the finals and in the 1991 Eastern Conference Finals, Michael would finally get his chance to get even. Switched off and was able to steal, leading to the... Jordan and Chicago would show Detroit they were not the same old boys. We've had success all season long. We seem to be you know, bonding together and getting stronger. This is the chance to make them back down or shake our hands or gain some revenge. Showcasing their unity, Jordan and the Bulls relentlessly attacked the Pistons in waves and as a team. They humbled Detroit in a resounding four-game sweep. The Detroit Pistons heading back to the locker room. Their season has concluded while the Chicago Bulls advance to the NBA Championship Round. Looking back, I'm very happy that we did, we went through those circumstances because it taught us how to, to understand what winning was all about. And maybe I became more of a team leader at that time, you know, emotionally and, and, and by example. It's been seven years we've been trying to get to this point, and each year we've gotten closer and closer. And we just don't want to get complacent with getting past the Detroit Pistons. You know, we're in the finals. We may not ever get to this point again. Let's lay everything on the court, and hopefully uh, we can have a world championship by the time we, uh, this season's over with. Michael Jordan had waited seven years to play for a title, and now his time had finally arrived. Bird was viewed as a winner, and Magic was viewed as a winner, and a winner equated with being the great player of the game. And he could score all these points, and he could sell all these sneakers and make all these commercials, but Magic used to tell him, you can't buy the rings, and it drove him nuts. What separated me from Larry Bird and Magic Johnson was, you know, they had championships to back their individual accolades. So, I mean, uh, that drove me more so than anything to get into that elite club. If the Michael Jordan had a choice of, of uh, conquests in 1991, what team would he like to defeat? Who would he like to get the best of? It would have been Magic Johnson and the Los Angeles Lakers. To go against the guy who had won more than anybody else, I think was a huge challenge for Michael. Adding to the allure of the matchup 
was the fact that Magic and Michael had captured the league's last five MVPs. And their meeting would set the stage for an unprecedented media frenzy. This series tends to be, at least in the public mind, Air Jordan against the Magic Man. There's no question, you're not going to avoid the Magic Michael thing. It couldn't have been more perfect, as these charismatic figures were more than willing to play along with the media storyline. Look who we have uh, coming, walking into this, into the station. Magic Johnson, how, you how are you? How's it going? It's going on, brother. How you been, man? You know, as we said at the time, there's magic in the air. I mean, it was, it was a magical time uh, uh, for sports because of these two figures and, and the place they had taken in society, not just sports, but in society. She's got, I think, five of those championship yeah, rings. You've only got one. one. <laughs> <laughs> Magic's era, when Magic was in his prime, it was still a sport. And they, the story was the game and everything connected with the game. When the Bulls started coming along in Michael, it was it was beyond just sport. Now it was it was really entertainment. It was big business. So you had the Wall Street Journal, you had entertainment, and you had every everybody connected with entertainment involved now because now it was not just a game, it was a show. I could barely sleep before those games. I mean that to me, that was the ultimate. I guess for people who are around 40 years old or younger. That was our Wilt versus Russell. I mean, that was as good as it got. And the hoopla around it was unbelievable. You know, I, I think just because you got those two guys who draw so much attention uh, that you had media from everywhere in the world, uh, it was just a zoo. Magic and Michael had been responsible for the growth and popularity of the league in the 80s. And now they would experience it in full. It was uh, bigger in, in terms of publicity-wise than any other series that I had been in before. This is what you live for, to play Michael Jordan in the finals. And then uh, it even made it bigger when, you know, I had my t-shirt company and I had a, a, a license to sell Michael Jordan t-shirts in the finals, and he didn't like that at all. <laughs> Jordan probably also didn't like the fact that most people assumed his Bulls would lose the series. Because the NBA history up to that point said that in order for you to succeed, you must first fail, a lot of people just assumed that the Bulls were in their first trip to the finals. They were going to experience failure. Things were stacked against us, but we, we didn't feel like we had anything to lose. We got past the biggest hurdle that we felt was in, in our way, which was Detroit. We just want to go out and make a name for ourselves and, and make a statement and get ourselves into that elite class, which is what Chicago has always wanted, you know, but yet they always had to settle to, well, wait until next year. You know, that was the old theme in Chicago, and we wanted to, to erase that as, as quickly as possible, and this was our opportunity to do so. The series opened on Sunday afternoon, June 2nd. <laughs> and from the outset, it lived up to its billing. Michael came out firing, while Magic answered by relaxing his Lakers, and then giving them a little bit of everything. Magic with the spin. Oh, he assaulted the criminal Divas. What a play. Magic Johnson. With the game up for grabs, Magic led a third quarter surge to give L.A. the lead. 22 seconds to go. Magic with a three-point shot. Scores! All right, Magic fires a three. Good! Magic Johnson has taken over with two three-pointers in the last minute and a half of the third period. The fourth quarter would be Michael's time to respond. Don't leave Michael alone here. It's not time yet. That's right. You guys run away from your offense. Don't run away from your offense. Mirroring magic, Michael brought the Bulls all the way back. Jordan guarded by Scott. Jordan turns in the lane, gets the shot up. Good oh, yes, yes. on yes! Scott. The stage was set for a classic finish. We got the lead. Jump shot to 
with his Lakers trailing by two with 23 seconds to play, Magic showed why he was still the NBA's preeminent floor general, especially with the game on the line. And Harkins goes for three. He's got it. He wins for the shot from downtown to take the lead. Playing in his 47th finals game, Magic had responded like a champion. Now Michael, playing in his first, would have one last chance to answer. All right, here we go. One in time. Michael, if they all run at you, remember Scotty's right here. Bill's right here. Back back to him. Nine seconds. A lot of time. Pass me the aspirin bottle. Get the oxygen tent ready. This is unbelievable. You're thinking, God, you know, he can't do it every time. I mean, he's done it so many times. I mean, it's time to miss one. To the surprise of no one, the Bulls put the ball in Michael's hands, and his team and 18,000 Chicago Stadium fans expected him to deliver them a game one victory. They lob it over the top to Jordan. Jordan gets it, changes direction, pull up jumper left side. Come on, baby. Michael Jordan had missed, and Magic had drawn first blood. The Los Angeles Lakers steal game one from the Chicago Bulls. The final sequence of events seemed to confirm that the Bulls were not quite ready to assume the throne. Once that game's over, you're figuring, okay, that was Chicago's best shot if they were going to win this thing. That was their best shot. They can't, now they got to, you know, they're going to have to beat him in L.A. Well, they're not going to beat him in L.A., you know. So uh, you figure that uh, that's it. That was the series right there. But Michael Jordan had waited too long to let one game break his will. I'll never forget. It's late in the game. They're losing, and Michael Jordan, like, looks over and just winks. Like, okay, they're having their day, but this is a long way from over. If you ever can have a moral victory from a loss, then that was a moral victory for us because they weren't as tough as we anticipated, and we had a chance to beat them. Having seized the early lead in the series, the Lakers were relaxed and confident going into game two. Los Angeles Lakers are in the catbird seat after lifting the home court advantage from the Bulls. You get to this point, and they will drown you, flat drown you. Now remember the energy that got us here. We've got to rebuild the momentum as you got us have to go big. The Bulls knew they needed game two badly. And they came out and played like it. Michael Jordan just kind of running the show, distributing the basketball. What a pass from Jordan. With Jordan driving them, the Bulls took a first half lead. Steps out on a switch and Wayne able to take the pass from Jordan. But ironically, it would be Jordan's overzealous defense that would seal L.A.'s fate in the second game. And that is number three, Oz Jordan. Here's Magic with the basketball. Scotty at the top, and we're taking Magic out of the ball. To protect Jordan, Phil Jackson asked Pippen, not Michael, to guard Magic. Notice the matchup with Pippen on Magic, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, able to bump, be physical with Magic. You're going, what's he doing? He can't guard Magic. Magic's going to go right by him. Well, Magic doesn't go right by him. <laughs> he sticks with him. He's got his hands up. He's active. Then you start to see, as soon as he crosses midcourt, here comes Grant. Grant's doubling. Well, what are you doing? This is Magic Johnson. You can't double-team Magic Johnson. He's going to find the open guy. You're going to give up a layup. All of a sudden, Grant runs back. He gets back to his guy. And you're going, what is this that they're doing? <laughs> and now Magic Johnson can't run this offense. And he's really throttled. And he's having a lot of trouble. And he's really sweating. And nobody's seen Magic Johnson sweat like that before. After shackling Magic, Pippen and Jordan would lead Chicago in an offensive onslaught. Trolling a alley -oop pass underneath the... Yo, oh, it's and good! It yes! 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 Jordan. There's Pippen. The Bulls blowing the Lakers out. And then late in the game, Michael would give the series its defining moment. I thought 
he wanted to say something to the Lakers, that I'm going to do something that you've never seen before. The look away to Livingston. As I was watching the move, and right now I'm seeing it in slow motion, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The play was a breathtaking response to Magic's first game performance. And when he went up, I mean, I'm standing right there, and uh, I, I guess he thought that Sam Perkins was going to jump, so he went up. And then he switches his hand, and I'm going, what's he doing? <laughs> what's he doing? And he goes to the other hand, and he kind of flips the ball up, and the ball goes in. And for like a half second, it was a discernible amount of time, there was silence in the stadium. <laughs> because everybody was just kind of like, huh? <laughs> I was like, <gasps> And I'm like, oh, wake up, you're playing against him. <laughs> and I think that was kind of like him laying down the gauntlet, saying, hey, this is serious, fellas. This is not going to be a Laker walk in the park, and you're not going to punk us and take us out of what we do. This is part of what we do. This is who I am. Can you deal with it? It was his game tonight. He really took it over in the second half. The only thing is, no matter if you get beat by one or 20, it's still 1-1. The teams headed back to L.A. with the Lakers holding the home court advantage. It doesn't get any better than this. This is the Magic Kingdom, California. The Forum had been a basketball graveyard for Laker opponents in the past, but these Bulls were now brimming with confidence. I think when they got to L.A., they really felt that they were going to come in here and jump on us right from the beginning of the game uh, and try to put us away. But it was L.A. who controlled game three from the outset, giving the Bulls a taste of their own medicine. Ball in low to Vladi. Vladi against Jordan again. Down the middle, he gives to Worthy. Worthy gives to Perkins. Slam dunk! But just when it seemed as if the Lakers were going to close the game out, Bulls substitute Cliff Levingston came to the rescue and inspired a fourth quarter comeback. He checked it emphatically by Levingston. Help, help! And a beautiful look away. Short for Pippen. And the game. With the game up for grabs in the final moments, 23-year-old Laker center Vladi Divac would step forward and audition for the role of hero. Going for the game winner. I remember Vlade wandering over to Magic. It was like, uh, oh, Master, have I pleased you? Did I do it right? Uh, aren't you proud of me? He was so pleased with himself, but he needed the approval from the Master. Trailing by two with nine seconds left and his Bulls in possession of the ball, Jordan would get a chance to tie the game and get redemption. Phil gave me the ball full court, and uh, he told me to take my time, do whatever I have to do, get the defense off balance and go straight to the hole. Full court press. Jordan against Byron Scott. Once again, the fate of the Bulls rested with Jordan. And this time, he wasn't going to let them down. Takes it right in the lane, comes up shooting. Got it. Yes! Game tied with 3.4 left. Now he's such a, a strong performer under those uh, circumstances. He could take the pressure, relish in the pressure, and succeed with it. You know, the great ones, everyone can know what's coming, and you still can't stop it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Magic had those moments, and, and now you begin to see that out of Michael. Michael's clutch shot seemed to energize him, and Jordan charged into overtime, ready to seize the game. Once it went to overtime, I remember thinking, the Lakers look tired. <laughs> they look tired. You know, and the Bulls are young, and they got legs, and they're fresh, and Michael's hungry. Michael spins out, baseline left to the hoop, reverse layup is in. A spectacular play by Jordan. We got caught watching him sometimes because he was just outstanding. I tell you, 
playing well enough is not good enough when you're playing against Michael. Chicago's eight-point overtime win gave them a two-to-one series lead and seemed to signify a permanent shift in the series. Suddenly, uh, I saw uh, in this Laker team uh, not despair, but God, uh, these guys are for real. They're coming. Well, on that point, let's go downstairs. Mike Dunleavy, the Lakers coach, is breaking it down. Well, we're in a ditch. Not in a hole, we're in a ditch. Throwing his whole game at the Lakers, MJ decimated them in the first half. Here goes Jordan to Grant. Back to Jordan. He takes the last shot of the half. He hits it. I knew that he was unstoppable. I knew he had the ability to sense if a defender was a little bit afraid of him. And if he sensed that you had a little bit of anxiety, it was, it, it was over. With the Lakers weakening, MJ went for the kill. And while Magic valiantly tried to rally the Lakers, he couldn't sustain an attack. Right for the rebound, quick out of the pass, down court, Michael to Pissler, and jams! They have a birth of giving up, boy, just keep it right after They're having a hard time building the energy. Game four belonged to Michael, and it was obvious Magic couldn't stop him. Magic, uh, I think, uh, began to look a little, a little old there, and, and he wasn't happy with the way that some of his teammates were responding. So it was, it was a really, uh, the situation kind of deteriorated. You know, the thing about it is that I, I can't feel bad because they've just given us a nice butt kicking. Michael's seven-year odyssey from a brilliant individual performer to a champion was now just one game away, and he was determined not to wait any longer as he attacked the Lakers with a fury on every possession. He bots with a bounce pass in Jordan, a steal, tight ropes the sideline, all the way to the hoop for the dunk. Even the fans here wanted that one. But like the true champion that he was, Magic rallied his Lakers for one final stand. With the game hanging in the balance, Michael would face one final test that showed how far he had grown as a player. When they get into the timeout with six minutes left, and Phil, people are screaming, and the Lakers are getting back in this game, they're winning that game, and he says, who's open? And, nobody's, and he looks at Michael, grabs his he says, who's open, Michael? And he says, Paxson. He says, that's right, get him the ball. Who is that, man? That's a get. Who is that, Paxson? Get. I'm right here. MJ's here too. I want Paxson to get involved. I think what Phil was trying to express at that time was just that, you know, you don't have to do it all on your own. We, we we're in a position to win this championship. It's game five of the finals. We had won 61 games that year. Um, and other guys had stepped up and contributed. Uh, you know, here's the opportunity to, to trust the, the guys around you. But with the game hanging in the balance. Michael would face one final test that showed how far he had grown as a player. No one would ever question Michael Jordan's leadership abilities again. I vow to, to, to show to everyone that a scoring leader can also be a successful team leader. Paxson open again. John Paxson continues to provide shots. He kept giving the ball up to Paxson, and that was the end of it. And that was the end of it. Michael before that wasn't the dominant Michael before. When he got to the finals, he became the dominant force and the world's best player. Because during that finals, he made everybody come up to the same level as him, and he made his teammates better. You can start to say the word. 
Chicago Bulls. Watch out, baby. June 12, 1991, Michael Jordan became a champion for the first time as Chicago defeated L.A. in five games. And the Chicago Bulls have won their first ever NBA championship. A series that started out as another Laker coronation had ended up as a coming out party for the Bulls and their star, Michael Jordan. Seeing Jordan celebrate so passionately must have reminded Magic Johnson of his own first title, one that he celebrated 11 years earlier. In this series, Magic had done all he could, but in the end, he couldn't stop Jordan or the sands of time. Michael and the Bulls' resounding victory was not only a personal triumph, it was a statement, one that was unmistakable to both Magic and his Lakers and to the sporting world. They got beat. <laughs> they got beat. And I don't think Magic had ever gotten beat before by somebody. And he knew it. And I think he realized, I'm not the best anymore. <laughs> I'm not on the best team anymore. That was it. A, a new king, a new court had been anointed. And uh, Magic, in a lot of ways, that was basically it for him. And that was basically the start of Michael Jordan. It was the beginning of a new reign and the end of an emotional journey. He needed to just go out and win this series to sort of slay the dragon finally, to stand on Magic's chest and say, it's over, your time is over, now this is my time. When you saw Jordan in the locker room after the game and he's got the trophy in his hands and he's crying and all of that, I think you realized that this meant more to him than we thought it did, <laughs> you know? We knew he wanted to win, but we didn't know how bad he wanted to win. Yeah, I was really happy to prove all the critics wrong about scoring champions, about Michael Jordan not making his teammates better, you know, not being able to succeed in, in, in and win a championship, you know, those are the things I thought about. I don't think I've ever seen an individual want something as badly as he wanted the championship. And then when he did win that championship, that was like, you know, uh, a sign to him that I have arrived. And the fact that he got one of the two, didn't get Bird, but he got Magic in the, you know, in the end of their careers, I think was a little bit of an all mode on the, on the pie that really tasted good for him. As Michael celebrated the end of his quest to overtake Bird and Magic, he could not have foreseen how complete an ending it would be. Magic would never challenge for another championship and would soon retire from the game. Um, because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. I remember writing, the NBA's era ended, the NBA's golden era ended yesterday, because we all thought November 7, 1991 is the end of the gravy train, and that the league may be successful, it may be popular, but it'll never be the same. The Lakers were the ones who said, it's okay to play this way. You can still be flashy, but you can still play defense. And they won in a way that was both efficient and entertaining. And I think there was a little bit of fear that maybe, you know, Michael Jordan is, is Michael Jordan and the Bulls are good, but maybe we're gonna lose a little bit of this flair in the game now that the Lakers dynasty is gone. But Michael never sacrificed style for substance. And in fact, he helped lead the NBA into a new golden age. When MJ showed up, his airness uh, just just stood up on a different plateau and said, "Guys, this is my show for the for the for a very long time, and the rest of you guys are just going to have to be happy being second best because I'm not giving this up until I'm ready to." Magic would stage a brief comeback and Michael would play with him again on the Olympic Dream Team in 1992. You can't get too close to Michael, it's a foul. 
<laughs> you haven't committed a foul in almost a year and a half, man. How can you talk? <laughs> My goodness. And for all the popularity Michael would achieve, for all the accolades and trophies he would go on to win, he would always hold a special place for the first one and for the player who helped spur him to his greatest heights. I feel great privilege and proud to play against a guy who's had the most success in the 80s. I think it, it was the passing of the torch of the eras. I'm just happy, and I was happy to pass the torch to Michael because I knew that I was passing it to somebody who was great. So you never be sad because you had your turn. You know, when, you, when Dr. J passed it to Larry and myself, we, we did our thing. We had fun playing, we had fun winning. And here comes another guy named Michael Jordan who was just like us, who had fun playing the game, loved to compete, loved to win, uh, but also was somebody who was special. And passing on the torch, you, only, you, you could only pass it to another special guy. And this guy was special. And in one historic series, these two special players saw their destinies intertwine, creating a moment in NBA lore they will share for The spin. Oh, he's off the dribble of Divas. What a play. Magic Johnson. Jordan.